Welcome to the Thinking Practitioner Podcast, a podcast where we dig into the fascinating issues, conditions, and quandaries in the massage and manual therapy world today. I'm Whitney Lowe. And I'm Till Luca. Welcome, welcome to, to the, the Thinking, Thinking Practitioner. Practitioner. And welcome to the Thinking Practitioner Podcast, where Books of Discovery has been a part of massage therapy education for over 20 years. Thousands of schools around the world teach with their textbooks, e-textbooks, and digital resources. Books of Discovery likes to say learning adventures start here, and they see that same spirit here on the Thinking Practitioner podcast and are proud to support our work, knowing we share the mission to bring the massage and bodywork community enlivening content that advances our profession. Check out their collection of e-textbooks and digital learning resources for pathology, kinesiology, anatomy, and physiology at booksofdiscovery.com, where Thinking Practitioner listeners can save 15% by entering thinking at checkout. How are you, Whitney? I'm doing well, sir, today. How are you? I'm pretty good. How are you, Robert Schleit? Great to have you with us today. I'm doing very well, and I'm looking forward to a chat with the two of you. All right. I, I'm looking forward to it, too. You have some interesting ideas, as usual, to share with us. I'll introduce you briefly, and then we'll get into those. You have been called, Robert, one of the founding fathers of modern fascial science, as you were instrumental in organizing the Fascial Research Congresses, which started at the Harvard, at Harvard School of Medicine in 2007 and the five fascial congresses since then. You trained both as a certified rolfer, where I met you when you were on the faculty of the Rolf Institute. You trained both as a certified rolfer, where I met you when you were on the faculty there at the Rolf Institute, and uh, you trained as a Feldenkrais practitioner and you've been a bridge between clinical practice and science for many decades. You were a co-author. You were listed as a co-author in a very interesting recent study, Myofascial Stiffness of Plantar Fascia and Achilles Tendon in Individuals with Plantar Fasciopathy, an Observational Cross Study. And that's what we want to talk about today because it's an interesting one. Welcome, Robert. Anything else people should know about you? No, I love fascia and I love networking and I love the two of you for that reason. <laughs> <laughs> we love you too. Yeah. Well, let's jump right in. Can you tell us a little bit about the paper's main findings and then maybe we'll talk about some of the details? Yes. Uh, so this is a nice outcome in my personal development. Um, as you mentioned, uh, for 20, 30 years, I did most of my work with my hands and my heart connected with my clients. But in the last 10, 15 years, I shifted towards laboratory research and spent more time in uh, scientific research than I do with my clients. And in that field, I've shifted with my attention that I'm now more, I have to get used to it, a, a senior scientist now <laughs> and a mentor to some of the young scientists who are looking for guidance. Mm -hmm. And that is one of the very rewarding outcomes for me, because the laboratory work has been done in Brazil, in a laboratory that I have never been. In most of the fascia laboratories, I have been. But in this one, I have not been. But I connected with them over three years. I gave them not only my smart advice and my critical questions, but I gave them a measurement tool also and gave them advice to how to use it. And they used that measurement tool that tries to uh, replicate our finger touching for tighter spots in the tissues uh, as opposed to softer spots. So it measures tissue stiffness. And that's what you often palpate. So mm -hmm. we developed a technical touching finger that I'm showing here for those of you who have uh, the monitor to look at it. I'm holding up the Indento Pro here. Mm -hmm. That's a tool that we developed in the last 10 years at uh, Chemnitz University. And they used that on the plantar fascia of people who had pain on the bottom of the foot. And there are different names for it. Plantar fasciitis is the most common name. But now many people call it plantar fasciopathy because they are not so clear whether it's uh, uh, inflammation. inflammation. Uh, so people with that uh, pain on the bottom of the foot, they selected those who have it more on one side than on the other. And mm -hmm. they compared the stiffness of the plantar fascia with that tool. 
and uh, compared it on the painful side with, with the less painful side. And not only that, they also measured the color standard. And um, they measured I, what? I'm sorry. So I was very uh, uh, intrigued about that study, and uh, we can discuss the findings. But basically, that was the publication. Mm -hmm. So I'm sorry, Robert, you said they measured the stiffness and something else? I didn't quite hear. What, uh, what else ah, uh, they measured the stiffness on both sides, on yeah. the painful leg and on the less painful leg, on the bottom of the foot, on the plantar fascia, but also on the Achilles tendon. On the Achilles tendon, got yeah. you. Yeah. Okay, and they found some surprising things, surprising to us uh, that maybe uh, make us question some of our assumptions, at least it did for me when I saw your post about it. Let's get into that. But what about the indental pro, the indentometer itself? You said it's like a finger and you can use it to measure for tight spots or different qualities of the tissue. What exactly does it measure? How does it work? Ah, you, you do it similar like if you are touching the body, you press with vertical compression your finger one millimeter into the tissue, two millimeters, but hardly more than one centimeter. <laughs> mm. And you measure the resistance or you measure how much force do you need uh, in order to indent the tissue one millimeter, five millimeter, et cetera. And usually if, the, if it's a homogeneous tissue, it's a linear increase. So on the first millimeter, it gives you, let's say, 100 grams of resistance. On the next uh, one millimeter, 200 millimeters. And then the linear increase of the force needed to indent it or of the tissue resisting you, you can measure the same way, is called the young modulus or the stiffness of the tissue. And uh, pudding has a softer stiffness than wood. <laughs> and iron is even so, uh, stiffer than wood, who, who wanders, yeah. So we wanted to know, uh, is one of the legs more like a pudding and the other one is more like wood? And that's what you can quantify here. And when you do it with your hands, it's uh, sometimes, of course, easy to do. But often your expectation influences what you feel. Yeah. And uh, this is a big problem because we are never free of bias as a practitioner. You yeah. see the color, you, you see the painful reaction of the client, and your, your brain cannot ignore that. But this machine can ignore <laughs> all the other sensory inputs. So that is one advantage. Right. i um, got a question about that with the, the graphing of the pressure that you mentioned. You mentioned it was a, a linear um, graph of, of pressure versus, you know, stiffness. And, and that seems to me a, a little bit at odds with a lot of what we know, for example, about you know, ligamentous tissue or some of the other connective tissues that have a certain degree of elasticity and then the, the curve drops significantly because you know they, they have a greater degree of stiffness after that initial pliability is is gone. So that wasn't reflected with, with what you were finding then, huh? Do you mean uh, that it changes after a few seconds or after a few millimeters of depth? I didn't get you. Millimeters of pressure. So like ah, okay, assuming yeah, that the yeah. pressure is equal to some degree of, of elastic deformation of the, of the connective tissues. Yeah. So that's exactly a, a big challenge in biomechanics mm -hmm. because uh, they love to make simplifications. Mm -hmm. And the stiffness assumes that it's in a linear uh, increase. So if you have a rubber band and that for each centimeter of elongation, it increases in the same degree. And then you would define the stiffness as a Newton per millimeter or Newton per, uh, per percentage of elongation. Mm -hmm. And that's uh, a simplification. Yeah. So yeah. that's, that's exactly a, a big challenge. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't, necessarily correlate exactly with what we feel with our touch in, in that sense uh no. or does it is it does it measure things that are exactly correlated with something you or i might feel with our hands that is the other study that we published i didn't prepare to share that but i think it fits very well katya balch and i published a couple of months ago 
exactly an exploration of your wonderful question, Whitney. Mm -hmm. uh, how do we palpate and which machine is good at palpating if you have several layers of tissue lying on top of it with different stiffness? Yeah. That's mm -hmm. what you have in the human body. Mm -hmm. For example, and that's a big challenge also till because the skin is a really tight tissue. It is a piece of leather. I just returned from a wonderful dissection with Carla Stecco and John Jackie and many others. Libby Eason was also there in Northern Italy. And I think they are still dissecting as we are talking now. And we had fresh frozen cadavers. And the skin is a pretty tight insulating uh, rubber seal tissue. And uh, we should not underestimate that. And it, so that's usually like two, three millimeters. And then underneath, you have the subcutaneous connective tissue. If you want, you can subdivide that. But all the subcutaneous connective tissue is a third of the stiffness of the skin. Mm -hmm. So it is li li like a, a sticky sy syrup, jam, pudding, something like that. Yeah. And then underneath, you have the pretty thin, dense fascia, which is stiffer than the skin. But I was surprised to find out it's only like 30% stiffer than the skin, not 10 times stiffer. And so we found out when you palpate four layers of tissue, and we took the uh, thickness of the four layers and the relative stiffness, in our phantom gel pad model that Katia Barch and several others and I did out of some uh, uh, silicone similar phantom material, we took them for the adult human back in prone position, which is a common palpation. So if you palpate and, and say, let me feel your lumbar muscles or let me feel your lumbar fascia, you need to go through the skin. You need to go through the second pillow of the subcutaneous connective tissue, which is much softer. And then you're trying to feel the stiffness on the third layer. Mm -hmm. And what we found out is that none of our six instruments was able to detect the relative stiffness differences in the fascia because the other layers were too thick and or too stiff for your hand to palpate yeah. the stiffness underneath. So now I question, <laughs> also with me your touch, when you say, I feel the fascia is tighter on the right side, you're probably talking about another tissue, mm -hmm. about the subcutaneous connective tissue or about the skin or about the muscle fibers, which are much, much thicker than the fascia as the false layer underneath. So that is really a challenge. Yeah. So your experiments with models and with your very careful measurements have made you question whether or not we're feeling deeper fascia or not. Yeah, what? in in the relaxed position. Oh. On the plantar fascia, I, I don't question it yet. Uh -huh. Because the plantar fascia is really thick and stiff and the subcutaneous connective tissue, except for the heel pad but uh -huh. in the middle of the foot where this study was conducted is relatively thin. So okay. I, I'm, I, in this study, I trust that the stiffness that was measured, this is in dentometer, uh -huh. was mainly influenced by the fascia and not by one of the other three layers. But so in the human lower back, in somebody who lies relaxed in prone position, I question it now. Mm -hmm. question our ability to feel that specific yeah. deeper layers but in this case you're pretty comfortable with what you were measuring well yeah. just before we move on to the results what does this measurement do for us does it have direct clinical applications would i be using your device in my practice or is it mainly a research tool you could use it actually if you work with somebody over several weeks because okay. in one session you don't need it 
except as a sales thing to to tell the client you have 20 no, then, and, we are, <laughs> and they are impressed and they think till Lukau is much better equipped than the guy next door mm -hmm. but honestly you don't need that but because your hands should be able to to, to help out significant differences uh, this will be finer but if the difference is so small that only this fine instrument can feel it and not your hands then you can also question is it really does it really matter mm -hmm. you know if the difference is only half a percent but right. if you are treating somebody or you're watching their self-treatment stretching or jogging or whatever over several weeks then if the stiffness has become more healthy after six weeks and let's say an, a, a stiffer area in their neck has gotten 15% softer, you wouldn't be able to tell because you have touched 16, 600 clients in between. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. and if their stiffness has changed 50%, you may be able. But a 10% change over six weeks because you don't have numbers, I would question that you can detect it. Mm -hmm. If, uh, before and after uh, right left side so that's different but if both sides of the neck have gotten 10 percent more healthy or softer as compared before you can tell them keep doing your exercises mm -hmm. you know we have a very good chance that in half a year you will be out of pain because already now you are 18 percent better than you have been and that's the advantage a tool has numbers and your fingers don't have numbers Okay, this actually, I'm glad, I'm glad we're going here because your study, this one we're talking about now, had some findings that surprised me. Yeah. And there's actually been very little research done, as far as I'm, I know, on direct correlations between t tissue qualities and pain. Yeah. Uh, you know, Stecco yeah. did a couple, Helen Langevin, of course, did some. But you, your study, the study that you were co-author on found a correlation. Do you want to tell us about that? Yeah. Because normally, uh, I think uh, most practitioners preach it uh, at least three times per week, that there is a vicious, uh, uh, vicious cycle between tension and pain, mm -hmm. you know, wow. that they are chasing each other like a chicken and the egg. <laughs> and, uh, and you can start the vicious uh, cycle with an increase of muscular tension that leads to uh, mechanical pressure on the nerve, which by itself could elicit pain, or it leads to a lack of circulation, accumulation of waste products, etc. And then that leads to pain, and pain by itself would, according to that model, increase the muscular tension. That is a very plausible concept, and it often fits to our clinical experience. But even before the study and yeah. the surprising result found, other studies by Paul Hodges and many others have shown in low back pain, it is often the other way around. That the area of the back, let's say at the lower lumbar spine where you have your pain, or if it's more on the right side than on the left, on this side, the stiffness of the erector spinae myofascial tissue is softer on the painful side. And you also see in EMG that given the same task, the muscles are less active on the painful side. So that is another pain model where the pain inhibits muscular contraction. And then the, and that can lead to chronic pain via many, uh, uh, mechanisms later on and then you have to think completely different how can I activate these silent inhibited muscle fibers including their motor nerves and the brain regions much more so that was already an indication that sometimes it goes the other way now here on the plantar fascia it has been shown to be this, a similar dynamic as I just described for uh, back pain that the side of the foot that has more pain is softer on the plantar fascia, but also on the 
Achilles tendon, even so they often didn't have pain in the Achilles tendon, but the Achilles tendon seems to be mechanically linked with the plantar fascia. I want to and stop for a second and underline that. So the softer side was the more painful side or vice versa, and that extended to the Achilles tendon, yeah. suggesting but a link. These are the, the two main outcomes. And there have been in the last two years, other studies pointing in that direction with elastography. That is a very expensive technology that's very trendy now uh, among medical doctors who have lots of research money. But there are also questions about this method. But now we have a more palpable technique that is more close to how we as physiotherapists, as manual therapists, explore stiffness. And it points in the same direction as the elastography studies in the last one or two years have also shown. And they also showed in plantar fascio fasciosis, the fascia on that side is softer than on the healthy side. Did you yeah, all, I mean, um, I'm sorry, go ahead, go ahead. Go ahead. okay, I was just going to say, I'm, I'm curious if you had any thoughts or ideas about if the the softness in uh, or the the you know decreased degree of stiffness on the painful side is more cause or effect um that's a great question <laughs> yeah so in standing it would make a lot of sense that you stand more often during the week on your non-painful side mm -hmm. and that then is a mechanical stimulus for that side to become stronger and for the other one not yeah mm -hmm. so that could be one mechanisms how what you measure is not the cause of it but is the result of it the same has been described uh, for the inhibition on the back muscles too so it could go that way in yeah. walking it's more complicated because in walking you have your full body weight or almost your full body mm -hmm. weight on one leg at a time, so you can shift how, how many milliseconds you are on it. But the maximum loading should be similar on both yeah. sides. Mm -hmm. You have maybe a longer time, but whether that influences uh, the collagen synthesis more or less, that is more complicated. But in standing, I would agree. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if, if it is related, if stiffness in this case in the plantar fascia is related to pain, do you have any speculation about the mechanism? How does yeah. this relate? So in another study, not in the Brazilian study, the way I participated, they also showed the plantar fascia is thicker. And that seems to be often the case in myofascial painful pathologies. That's what Langevin found on the low back too. Huh? On the low back, so that the painful tissue is thicker, uh, but it seems to be softer in many cases. And then it could be a swelling. It could be fibro fibro fibrotic, where you have an accumulation of additional collagen fibers, or it could be not an increase of collagen type 1 fibers, uh, but a viscosity change in the ground substance. Mm -hmm. And then it would be like an edema, li like a tissue swelling. And I think that is most likely the case in many of these plantar fasciosis uh, examples, that you have a viscosity change. And that's now something that we can explore in the future, because if we do five indentations in rapid uh, sequence, we can see how is the dampening versus elastic recoil. And in a healthy tissue, if you bounce it five times, it should bounce back at the fifth time as quickly as on the fourth, uh, first mm -hmm. time. So it's just like a perfect elastic rubber band. But if you have pathology, often the rubber band becomes like a piece of ketchup or honey. So it bounces back with a time delay, and that's called dampening. Mm -hmm. And that is now something that we are eagerly looking forward to explore, because that would confirm that it's more a water binding change and more like a local uh, water binding swelling edema change. 
And that would be very important. So then I use my hands very different. I'm not trying to make a hard lumps softer. I'm trying to push the water uh, in and out of the sponge so that it has a different water binding. So, so would, would a practitioner, just let's go to applications for a minute. Would this research suggest anything that practitioners could use? Like say in some cases, uh, water binding or the swelling effect might be related to pain and other places, maybe densification or fibrosis might relate to pain. Yeah. Are there ways a practitioner could tell or have you added something to our repertory or ability to sense that? Mm -hmm. um, I would train my hand um, whether I have a viscosity change or just a stiffness change included in it. And I would compare vertical compression with diagonal or shearing compression and see if it's mostly a shearing change between the pathological tissue and a comparable healthy one on the other leg, for example, or whether it's only a stiffness change in a vertical uh, palpation. So that would be a nice teaching thing we could do together in our next uh, pre pre-training together till. Yeah. So we have a, a, a palpatory laboratory where you do vertical pressure and then one where the stiffness is the same, but the shearing angle is more restricted. So Can you so elaborate on that a little bit of just like, what would be the difference between those? Like what, what would be the, the, the cause for the difference in, in, in those between the, the vertical compression and the shearing compression? Um, Shearing would be how one layer that's located more superficial to the other one, how easy it is to move that in a horizontal uh, displacement in relationship to the lower one. Yeah, I'm, I'm, say that the shearing would be seeing what's happening at the interfaces. Are they able to yeah. move and shear yeah. against each other while the vertical is more the tissue yeah. quality itself? Yeah, and, and I would assume, but, but it's not black and white, that in the vertical one, it's more about the fibrotic resistance. And in the shearing, it's more about the lubrication, more whether the ketchup is warm or cold. Mm -hmm. So it's more the viscosity of the ground substance. But of mm -hmm. course, it's only a gradual difference. Yeah. Well, I, I interesting, imagine. interesting. Uh, um, I just had a very nice conversation. I'm looking to be in a long train ride with Jan Wilke, who is now a professor for fascia research in Austria, which is really a, a celebration for us. Now we, we don't have amateur researchers who are doing it out of their free pocket. He is running a big department at a university. And he said, I want to make fascia research the number one. That is part of his contract with him. And he found out that in myofascial pain, he explained, he explored it together with me in exercise induced um, delayed onset muscle soreness. The soreness shows more when you do shearing movements with your thumb then it shows when you do vertical pressure. Hmm. So in the past, we did vertical pressure and asked the client, tell me when the pressure changes into a painful sensation. That's typical ergometry. Trigger point pressure work. Threshold. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But now he uses his thumb and does a circular movement in the skin at a given force and ask the client on a pain scale from 1 to 10, how painful is this? And that is a more sensitive measurement for delayed onset muscle soreness than the classical algometry. Mm -hmm. So it's called pain sensitivity scale. I didn't know about that. So, so that will be also something that a clinician could use, that you ask the client how comfortable or how uncomfortable uncomfor is a vertical pressure on the painful limb, and a shearing, so where you take your thumb and you make circles in the tissue and you shear, shear the skin two centimeters in a large circle in all four directions. 
And if the pain is more elicited with the second style, you may have more uh, ground substance change related with inflammatory cytokines than a classical fibrosis. That's at least our current speculation. Mm -hmm. And then the, what really counts from the client's point of view is our ability to change that or help that yeah. or to change the pain. So yeah. I'm just thinking for myself, there's such a role in checking in with the client, talking to the client, getting their report. You mentioned the pain scale, but even over time, having them notice or report back is what we're doing, increasing the pain, decreasing the pain. That's a lot of the information loop I'm using as a yeah. practitioner yeah. as well. And I think we should... So when you work on the bottom of the foot, you should not only use vertical pressure. So you use your fingertips or your thumb or whatever. And then you ask the client to reach forward, to step backwards so that you create diagonal angles in the tissue. And then you see how is the pain sensitivity in each of these directions. Mm -hmm. So I think we have been always doing that. But that also means foam rolling is very limited unless mm -hmm. you fix the roll that it doesn't roll anymore. There are now devices. So you fix the roll that it doesn't roll and then you do and a you shear. Yeah. But you could do that at any stone on the ground. You don't need to buy a, a, a roll. Well, speaking of fancy rollers, Sue Hitzman has a lot of shearing kind of things she does with rollers. Oh, nice. Makes, yeah. yeah, it makes me think of Greg Lehman's joke that foam rolling is like you, you, you it would be like trying to die what do you say trying to fillet a chicken with a rolling pin you're not going to fillet the chicken you're going to mash the chicken yeah. if you just match yeah. that you're what yeah. you're saying supports that it isn't yeah. about just squishing yeah. it or mashing it but but also these metal tools like rasten tools etc they uh -huh. give your hands a better grip and uh, i i just finished the talk with um, Eric Owens, he is a founder of a day loss therapy, and he gave me this um, gumdrop, and it's better than my hand because it has a different edges, and I can put it on the tissue and then push forward, and it has more grip. So, so, so I, I'm now looking at additional tools, not to replace my hands, but to make my hands sometimes elongated or more powerful or give my hands more grip in the tissue. Curious future too, in terms of... We need to talk about instrument-assisted work at some point. Future mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That, that would be a topic with all the dangers it has. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Also, just curious in, in terms of other ways in which to do this to enhance that shear force application, do you think that you might actually even get more significant results in some instances when you were applying shear force and then moving the tissues up from underneath that by you know, shortening and elongating them by joint movements simultaneous with that soft tissue manipulation. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. uh, also, uh, when you ask them to do the movement rather than you do it, they are full. Of, they cannot daydream at the same time. Mm -hmm. If you tell them, keep going, keep going, they are a little bit more, yes, they are now slower, slower. Mm -hmm. Their full engagement is precisely where you're interacting with them. And anybody, so that's another important aspect, of course, we are not only changing the viscosity of the tissue, but the perceptual connection of your nervous system with whatever sensory stimulation comes from the plantar fascia. Mm -hmm. And there have been several studies to show that the client attention makes a huge difference to whatever stimulation you give to them. So uh, these client active movement participations are a gold mine. Mm -hmm. There's the idea that pain's function is to get our attention and shift our behavior. So why wouldn't we use our client's attention when we're working with pain as well? That's a nice one, too. I mm -hmm. like that. Yeah. You know, I really, I enjoyed seeing your Facebook post about this. We'll go ahead and put a link to that in the show notes where you talked about some of the clinical applications. When I went and downloaded the paper and read it, I was excited to see that it was about plantar uh, pain mm -hmm. as well, because that's a particular place that I had 
quite a bit of pain for a long time. I would have been, I would have qualified as a subject for the study, I think. Mm -hmm. And then I also just finished, like you, Robert, I just finished a dissection with fresh cadavers. This one was with Wojtek Kakowski, yeah, and uh, Todd Garcia. And I was looking especially at plantar layers and heel yeah. pads. Yeah. And I was surprised at how soft they were, even on the harder body styles we yeah. had. It was yeah. very soft fat there on the heel. I, I expected something much more fibrous than I found. So yeah, to have cool. your yeah. to have your study come out with a, a measurement of stiffness of this was amazing timing and yeah. synchronicity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's the other maybe secondary finding of this study, that the stiffness change was not only found in the painful tissue itself, in the plantar yeah. fascia, but it was equally reflected in the Achilles tendon. So there have been many indications, but that is now another robust one, that they are functionally like one mechanical unit. And uh, that they are not just sometimes influencing. Basically, it is like the patella tendon and its connection with the quadriceps. So normally, the patella is mobile. If it would be fused with the femur, they would be disconnected. <laughs> mm -hmm. But if the patella can slide one centimeter up and down, then whatever tension you have above the patella will be reflected below. And that is now the concept and the dissection that we did in the last two days may be similar to yours, uh, Till, where we see the Achilles tendon has actually two parts and they are linked with each other. Uh, they are linked not only via the calcaneus as a bony intersection, but also via the heel pad as a soft patella-like plate. And then tension in one end will immediately be reflected in the extension of it. So you could make a cause to call the plantar fascia as um, distant Achilles aponeurosis. <laughs> so right. that would be another. Yeah. You're describing, I thought you were going to say the calcaneus is like the patella, but you're saying the heel pad itself. Oh, oh be, yeah. Oh. So you have two two of these hypomoclion. How yeah. they are called. So hypermoclion. Yeah, so that's a nice name. Hypo, hypomoclion. It, it, it's like a, a change of direction in a mechanical pulley system. And for that, so the patella is a hypomoclion in biomechanics, but only if it moves. If it's fused with the femur, it cannot do that. So both the calcaneus, when it's uh, free to move, for example, in a closed chain with your foot on the ground and the heel in the air, then the, then the calcaneus can be like the patella, a hypomoclion a shifting piece in between one or two pieces of mechanical tension. Mm -hmm. uh, but if the calcaneus is fixed, then you can move behind the calcaneus via the heel pad. And we are one of the few animals who have the heel pad so strongly expressed on the ground. And in young people, the heel pad can move four or five millimeters in relationship to the calcaneus. And in old people, it's fused with the calcaneus or fused in parenthesis. And then we can argue that's a pathology. So if your heel pad cannot slide in relationship to the calcaneus, not more than one or two millimeters, which is often the case in shoe wearing adults in Western concrete cities. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. Yeah, uh, that's as pathological as if your patella would be fused with the femur, and then you wonder why the tension transmission doesn't work anymore, and why the rectus femoris cannot influence the knee joint angle anymore. So uh, this is a very nice concept, and that study emphasized that, that it's one functional unit. Something, you know, just thinking about this biomechanically, this is, you know, fascinating because we've, we've, you know, spoken for a long time about the, the coordinated action between the gastroc and soleus complex and the yeah. plantar fascia. But, you know, your, your analogy there about it being similar to the patella is really interesting. But also think about this in terms of, it seems, 
and obviously I'd probably want to you know, read a whole lot more about this, but biomechanically that that's mostly going to be a factor during the push-off phase because once you're at heel strike, yeah. you don't really have the opportunity to yeah. have that kind of like mobility or force transmission because the body weight is pressing the calcaneus into the ground and it's not really until you get that calcaneus up off the ground and start propelling forward at that point that you'd have a, a, a much more significant force transmission from from the uh, gastroc soleus, the tricep psoriae group into the plantar fascia. Do um, you yeah. think that's yeah. relevant there? Yeah. I think it's very relevant. Mm -hmm. uh, imagine your children would never walk normally. They would always walk with their knees on the ground yeah. and face then the patella would lose its mobility, maybe. Mm -hmm. It would yeah. fuse its femur. And then the patella tension may not reflect the tension of the quadriceps anymore. Yeah. So I think it's very important that uh, for children and also in puberty, you are not just walking. In walking, we land with our heel. And then you have the mechanism that you describe, but that you are jogging where you land with your forefoot as a closed chain and your calcaneus in the air. Mm -hmm. And then all that you are jumping, like, like hopping. Yeah. So then you land with the forefoot. The plantar fascia is, is, it gets a lot of tension that pulls the heel pad slightly more forward until it gets resistance from the calves. And then it may be pulled in the other way. So you have that dynamic. Right going forward and backwards of the heel pad, but also of the calcaneus. Right. And you have mm -hmm. that when you land with your forefoot. Mm -hmm. You don't have that when you land on your heel. Exactly. So I think it's yeah. very important that our children do a forefoot landing, and you do that by hopping or by jogging. Mm -hmm. And of course, more in barefoot, the whole barefoot debate, we don't need to open that box now. But yeah. uh, if you do running with barefoot, you tend to, not all of them, but two thirds of the people try to land more with the forefoot. Mm -hmm. And that would have some disadvantages, but it would have that advantage that we are talking about. Yeah. Well, what you're describing uh, really uh, affirms the way that I'm working with feet after my own recovery from that injury, the sliding, the yeah. uh, uh, connection up the back of the leg, the layering, the shearing, all those things, as well as just not trying to soften the tissue, which was your main point. We're not just yeah. about mashing. It's not about rolling pan on the chicken. It's about helping things <laughs> glide and slide. Mm -hmm. uh, there's, uh, you know, it was also what you're saying about the heel landing. Big piece of my recovery was actually barefoot shoes, not to open that debate, but shifting my weight farther forward, so it wasn't so much on the heel pad and really looking at when I was wearing those barefoot shoes. For running, it was great because I was forward. For walking around the concrete city, no, that would further enter it, for example. Yeah. yeah. It well, also, one conclusion of that Brazilian study uh, confirms a clinical observation uh, that many people with a lot of experience have practiced. Uh, when you have pain on the bottom of the foot, you treat, of course, the plantar fascia, but you also treat the non-painful Achilles tendon. And they say you should always do that in the same session. And the other way around, too. If the Achilles tendon is painful, you treat that one normally with eccentrical slow motion loading on a step. The eccentric uh, loading protocol is still the gold standard. Heel but, drops, yeah. Yeah, so the slow heel drops. But in the same session, please also treat the non-painful, or even if it's non-painful, the plantar fascia. And you get better results than when you only treat the pathological tissue. And now we have one more reason, because functionally they are coupled. Talking about treating them as a unit. Yeah. Well, what else do you want to tell us about your interest these days? What else is capturing your interest? What else should we know about? Well, I want to know about these water binding. Um, so um, if you have more dampening, um, I, don't, I still don't get it together because we know uh, that in the densification, how the stecos call it, 
where you have the hyaluronan in a more sticky form, where it binds less water and therefore you have more unbound water. But that tends to go along with more dampening and with an increase in viscosity. And I don't understand it because free water would be less viscous. It would be more like a warm honey and not like a cold honey or ketchup. So there is something I'm not understanding. So either it's not related to the resistance of water molecules, that it's more the hyaluronan itself, or maybe how the hyaluronan interacts with collagen type 3, or there is something about the water binding that I don't understand. So if any in the audience has an insight, <laughs> you can call me in the middle of the night. I, lo I love to hear that. because So that is a challenge. So when you have, for example, an epicondylitis, Antonio Stecco has shown that, then you have a higher viscosity and you have hyaluronan in a less water binding condition. And therefore, the water that is in the tissue and that is not less than before should be in an unbound condition. And we should call that edema. But unbound water should have less resistance to movement. And, but it seems to have more viscosity. And I don't understand it. Well, I personally have looked to you for decades now to help me increase my understanding of what's going on, of the mechanisms and possible explanations, and then to question my assumptions. So there's still so much to learn. And thank you so much for uh, your continued questions and discoveries and contributions here. I have another one. Uh, okay. We are now doing some stiffness measurement, not in prone, relaxed position on the lower back, huh? uh, but in the yoga child's position. Mm -hmm. Because there the muscle should be as putting soft as in prone, relaxed position. You can measure that in uh, this EMG. But the fascia should be three times tighter. And uh -huh. then it may be difficult it may be possible to feel fascial stiffness on one side as opposed to the other side, if there is a stiffness difference. So that's something one. So we want to explore pre-stretched positioning, how that influences what you touch and how stiff a, a tissue is, even if the muscles are relaxed. And I think mm -hmm. that's a important dimension because if you place the client in a pre-stretched position and they are relaxed, uh, the muscle pudding should be as soft as before, but the fascial envelope should be much, much tighter. And then you may be able to palpate. So that's yeah. something that we are doing now. Fascinating well, stuff. Down, yeah. So getting clear about it. Well, mm -hmm. anything coming up that you want listeners to know about? Uh, Till Lukau is organizing. Uh, dampen me if you don't need more people to join. Please, no, tell us. Okay, yeah. So uh, next summer in May, you and Bibiana, a common hero of us, ba are Bibiana doing Badenes. a mindful, walking, uh, spiritual, somatic pilgrimage on the Camino. And I think you are doing it already for the third or fourth time. And now I can join you and I'm looking forward to that. We are so looking forward to that, Robert, having you along with us. I'm sure we can have some great heel pad discussions and experiments and everything right. else. Yeah. You have to do barefoot backwards walking with me, and then you can <laughs> ask me to do all kinds of weird stuff with you. <laughs> okay. Yeah, you're joining us on, the, on our walking workshop in the Camino de Santiago in May 2024. We'll put a link into the site. Thank you for uh, mentioning that. Anything else you want uh, listeners to no. know about, Robert? No. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That's great. And where can people find out more about you and your work? Um, Somatics DE is a nice website. And uh, oh, my IT guy told me to tell people to follow me on Instagram and Facebook now because I'm shifting not to do newsletters. But whenever I get excited about something, and that's how you found this article from me. I will do a quick uh, uh, Instagram sharing. 
And right. so that would be a nice way to get connected with new insights and questions and discoveries. So follow me Good. on Instagram and Facebook. All right, we'll do it. Yeah. Always keeping up, Robert. That's amazing. That's great. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for sharing your time here with us today. This was a fascinating discussion for sure. Very appreciated, Robert. Great mm -hmm. to see you. Thanks again. Until next time. Okay. Bye-bye. Are you ready to take your skills to the next level? Our in-house sponsor today is Advanced Trainings. Come visit us there. Whether you've been practicing for decades or are just starting out, Advanced Trainings offers a wide range of online and in-person programs designed to boost your effectiveness, deepen your understanding, and inspire your professional creativity. With innovative self-paced programs ranging from one-hour certificate courses about some of the most common client complaints, including plantar foot pain, one I did with Whitney, uh, to comprehensive certification pro our comprehensive certification program, we offer practice-changing learning events with industry-leading instructors, all in a supportive learning community that will take your work to another level. Plus, I hope I'm not going to regret this offer, but for a, a limited time, thinking practitioner listeners can enjoy a free month of our amazing subscription when you sign up at advancedtrainings.com. Uh, explore our extensive library of courses, cancel any time and keep any credits you've earned, usually all from just 20 bucks a month, but for, again, for a limited time, for TTP listeners, enter the code thinking subscriber. That's thinking subscriber at checkout and get a full month for free. Why wait? Visit advancedtrainings.com today. And the Thinking Practitioner podcast is also supported by ABMP, the Associated Body Work and Massage Professionals. ABMP membership gives professional practitioners like you a package including individual liability insurance, free continuing education, and quick reference apps, online scheduling, and payments with Pocket Suite, and much more. ABMP CE courses, podcast, and Massage and Body Work magazine always feature expert voices and new perspectives in the profession, profession including articles from you, Whitney Lowe, and mm -hmm. myself. Thinking practitioner listeners can save on joining ABMP at abmp.com slash thinking. Thanks to you, all of our listeners, to our guest today, Robert Schleip, to our sponsors. Stop by our sites for the video, show notes, transcripts, and extras. My site is advanced-trainings.com. Yours, Whitney? And you can find that all on my site at academyofclinicalmassage.com. And if you have a story to share with us or a question you'd like us to address, just uh, record a short voice memo on your phone and email it to us, and we'll try to work it in. Our email is info at thethinkingpractitioner.com, and we'd love to hear from you there. Or you can look for us on social media. You can find me under my name, Whitney. And Till, for you. Till Luca is my name. Please rate us on Apple Podcasts. It really does help people find the show. And you can also hear us, of course, on Spotify, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, wherever else you get your podcasts. Thanks for uh, spreading the word, telling a friend. See you next time. Sounds good. See you then.